Welcome to Longevity Industries presentation of the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. I am your host, Dean Phillips, and today I have with me one of the giants of industry, one of our people from SME. Uh, full disclosure, uh, Brian and I have probably known each other for about a decade. I have with me Brian Holmes from KBH. C, of course, and he is the president. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Dean. Glad to be here. It is, of course, great to have you. Brian is, uh, has been a great leader for the SME for so many years, and uh, I'm so thankful to have him here today. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. I look forward to speaking with you. Yeah. So right off the bat, what are some of the changes you see coming over the next uh, next five years? Well, I think it's um, technology application, Dean. I, I see a lot happening in the additive manufacturing world. Mm-hmm. Um, having, having followed it for about 25 years now, and for about 20 years, it, it just kind of bumped along and did a little bit. And in the last five years, have been orders of magnitude difference. And I think with the New computing power, the, uh, the the software that they can run, and I see where there's there's so many advantages in additive manufacturing in terms of lot size, material usage, um, you know, probably a lot even in terms of energy. That I think it's going to be um, a, a real driver in the, in the coming year. And I'm looking forward to that. I'll tell you what, it's been, uh, it's been promised for a long time, but I, I think it's been tough to get the adoption going as well as we had hoped. Uh, Yeah. There's, there's, there's challenges. I think in the energy use, how you actually, um, put, put those little pieces together in terms of what kind of energy source you're using and then the accuracy. But as, as time goes by, people are working diligently on, on solving those issues. Uh, for a long time, the materials were a challenge as well, mm-hmm. but I certainly a lot of development in the amount the materials that can be used and the integrity of the finished product over the last five years. Yeah. And do you, do you think that there's some confusion in the different forms of technology? Because when you say additive, there's so many different, technologies that are being used, you know, stereolithography, you know, you you have a lot of people get confused with what is possible and what type of machine you need. Do you think that's causes some of the problems? Yeah, I think probably, I mean, definitely most of the hobby machines are still like FDM types, which still have improved dramatically over the last few years. Uh, and, and certainly the price point has, has plummeted. So we're seeing a lot of hobby makers or uh, people that have the, the ability to put together a, a, a 3d model can, can now make something where before they probably would have been, you know, buying machine tools for their, for their home shop or whatever. And as we see that expand, I think we're going to have a, a whole creative generation come through and understand the difference in design and enjoy designing on the computer and, and not necessarily cranking handles, but then just watch it build. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot there. Um, the, the changes in materials, you know, when I first looked at it, everybody kind of said, well, how can you do that with metal? But now you've got, you know, stereolithography, but you've also got your, your laser, uh, laser centering by layer, the hybrid mm-hmm. machines that can put it together and then do a, a quick finish machining on it. So you get a finished part as it comes out. It, it's really quite amazing. And then the size, I mean, these things all used to be, if you could do maybe a cubic foot envelope, it was, that was, that was good. But now it's like you're doing houses with it, a bit different technology, but but similar, I mean, they're still extruding concrete in some cases or, right. you know, whatever materials they need. So it, it really is impressive what, what's happened in the scale of, of how things have happened. I think it's interesting that you say that because, to me, one of the most important things that I've noticed is the creativity 
that goes into it. It's it's so much more than just technology. It's what can you imagine that you can do and then start working towards it. Like you mentioned about the concrete and you talk about uh, unlimited bed sizes where the you're joining uh, one section to another and you're able to make very long, uh, big, you know, like, uh, like at Oak Ridge where they do the BAM, which is a, a, a big area. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is, is, is what some people might say it was, but I know there were other people that said it was stood for something else, but, uh, but it, that, that type of well, additive manufacturing too. Well, it is, it is interesting. And in fact, um, with the, the, uh, the recent show we were at, the, yep. I got a chance to, to tour the uh, Georgia Tech, uh, mm-hmm. a kind of a development lab um, for for scaling things up with our old buddy Tom Kerfus. Yeah, and uh, and he had a couple of really big machines in there that were hybrids that you'd lay down the material and then you'd you'd machine it. And he was dealing with ferrous, non-ferrous. There was, there was quite a, a lot of options in there that you could work with. And, and these were not small machines. So, you know, and they were looking at that for potential aircraft repair parts. There's a, there's a lot of things that, you know, you wouldn't have thought that they would have the integrity for. And we're getting there where it does. So in the next five years, I think it's going to be totally revolutionary. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that holy grail of a mass produced price, but for a, a single unit is, you know, you can kind of see that in the future now where for a long time it was like, well, if you can get down to a hundred pieces, that'd be good. Right. Well, mm-hmm. you know, economically. And I think that, you know, gradually we're going to get closer and closer to that unit. Yeah. I mean, that might be a century off, but I, I, can still see it coming right right so so tell us a little bit about you know how you got involved in manufacturing and what was the uh what was your aha moment that was like oh i'm really interested in in manufacturing or technology well you know it was interesting growing up i was uh, you know like like a lot of us uh looking at cars and they are fascinating and i decided i wanted to work on cars and I started an apprenticeship at that. And then after about a year and a half, I was like, well, this is going to get really boring really soon because it's starting to now. <laughs> so, and I had a, uh, a friend that uh, was doing injection molding and in talking to him, uh, he said, oh, you know, you should study materials. And it was interesting because at one point I had done some looking at plastics and thought, well, that's interesting. They're so versatile. And again, right. It's, if you can call molding and, and uh, casting as additive type um, technologies, then I, it, sure. which in a way they are, right? Mm-hmm. They're an additive, they're not an attractive method. Right. And so I ended up um, studying materials and then ended up going to work for that same guy that was doing injection molding and spent the next 40 years at that company. And, and it was interesting because about, Three years in, SME had a major uh, membership drive to celebrate their 50th anniversary. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, I'm reading like four plastics magazines a month, but all my competitors are too. So, you know, where's the where's the, the leverage? And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to sign up. I can read about manufacturing and be good for the, you know, the, the, Manufacturing engineering was, was good at the time for, well, still is for uh, machine tool type operations, which was right in line with our, our tool making. Mm-hmm. So I was looking at that and then I got, I got recruited to help out and get a chapter going. And that opened my eyes because as a, as a custom manufacturer, which, which we were mostly supplying parts to other manufacturers, so understanding their processes made it much easier for us to meet their needs and not go down rabbit holes or have problems with, with how to deliver stuff and how to deliver it on time. 
And as part of that, I ended up uh, working, being on the West Coast here. The closest other chapter and, and uh, training areas, opportunities, were with quite a few people from, from Boeing in Seattle. Right. So I started to learn a lot about the other technologies. And I guess that's when it really, you know, it kind of bit me a little bit with PCs, but it really bit me with CNC and the, the potential for accurate machining quickly <coughs> for reducing tool costs. Now, in the early days, to do a one-off for an injection mold, and it was a little cumbersome. Like, you wouldn't want to use the tape machine or anything. You would have spent as much time programming as you as you did machining for one for a one-off. Right. But as that technology developed, I got, this is, this is really cool. And then we got into the next sort of evolution of technology was the, the flow simulations where you could model what the plastic was going to do in a mold and look at the cooling times and a lot of, a lot of different advantages. So we started doing quite a lot of that. And that was kind of really the, the big kick that took us into the 90s and, and started things moving forward. Finally convinced the mold makers that it was you could, you could do a design in a 3D model on a, on a computer and, and cut it accurately. And I wish there was some reluctance to at the time. Mm-hmm. And, and, and now, of course, everyone does. But that was, so that was a, a big thing. And then I guess one of the big deals that, that was a benefit to me was I was looking at a project for one of our customers for this large plug for a coal mine. And uh, these are kind of safety plugs so people don't fall down uh, grip holes and stuff. Right. And we looked at it and said, well, we just can't make it. And, and I'm bouncing stuff off. And I was at a, a tour with that to me with one of the local guys that did a foundry, that had a foundry. So we started looking at it and saying, well, you know, he can, he can cast some stuff. So, and, and leave like a quarter inch machining around it. Well, I had to contract out the machining because we didn't have anything big enough to turn what we were doing. But we ended up basically casting a core and cavity, which I think ended up with the patterns and everything cost us less than just the raw material would have to try and do it in a conventional subtractive way. And, you know, we didn't get necessarily the heat transfer we would have liked or, or some other issues, but we didn't have to make a lot of them. So it made the project viable to, to use a cast mold. And that was, that was it. From then on, I had, I had all the support I needed to, to carry on doing what I needed to do with, with SME because it, it made things possible that we wouldn't have seen as possible before. We would have just pooed it and walked away. Yeah. So, and then that, that followed up right with, again, right with the additive in the, in the late nineties, I got involved with the uh, metal injection molding, which was really interesting because the feedstock for that uses a sub 22 micron powder. And as I walk around today's shows and see 3d printers, they're using basically that same feedstock that was being used for injection molding. And then debinding and sintering the product afterwards to get, that's one of the techniques where they can get the same um, um, potential uh, uh, shapes. And so it's one of the things that I see in the future is that if you, if you want high volume injection molding is still uh, much, much more economical than 3D printing. Mm -hmm. But printing your mold is going to bring the cost down and make a lot more products viable. Right. And, you know, you have advantages of conformal cooling. Uh, there's all kinds of, uh, of benefits to it th- that uh, will allow increased throughput. So more product, quicker product development, which I think is just going to be tremendous for the industry. Yeah, and that's, I, I, I think material science has come so long, so far in such a short time uh, as far as what materials are possible to be used in different additive processes. I, th- I think we, when we first started, it was, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of the plastic based materials 
were very limited, but now we've been able to blend them with other materials and we've been able to use them just as a binder and still now add in metal and other, other materials. It's, it's unlocked so many opportunities. What? Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's really terrific. Just how many things can be done viably now because it's, it's cheaper. It, it re- reduces the cost. So it starts to make different products viable that weren't before, which is pretty much like what happened with the semiconductor industry. Mm-hmm. Right. And you know, we went from transistor radios to <laughs> computing power on our phones that are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yep. just, it, 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 I think even the guys in the electronics industry, if they looked at that 50 years ago, they would have told us we were crazy to even dream this stuff. And, right. and we have it now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, geez, I, I can remember when I was in, uh, I went to a vocational high school and we were still, lo- even though transistors and, and chips were already out, we were still learning vacuum tubes. And, you know, you think about yeah. a, a vacuum tube is basically one transistor and the millions that you can put on there now. And it, it's just, it boggles the mind. You know, yeah, exactly. Do you? Yeah, it 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 really is amazing, and I <laughs> I I think we're going to see some of that type as as it gets more and more popular, and more and more funding goes in that way. I think we're going to see the manufacturing power start to go the same way that computing power has, and frankly, it's the computer that made it possible. You know, yeah. I was talking about the metal injection molding when I got involved in it. I found out that they'd been playing with it since I think the late forties or 1950s. Mm-hmm. But the problem was they didn't have control of the powder, the feedstock blending, right. Or the molding process or the sintering process. Mm-hmm. And as all of those processes started to be driven by computers and they got the consistency, suddenly that whole process started to become viable. Right. And, and I think that's a, if you look and you boil down everything in additive and in manufacturing in general, a lot of these things, it's all controlled and advanced because of the ability to, uh, computer control and axes, whether that axis is just moving X and Y or whether it's moving up and down or whether it's how much material stock you're, you're able to feed at a time. Uh, and even heat, the temperature that you're able to, to heat to, all of those being computer controlled and being able to kind of balance all of that, you know, that all has worked to give us tremendous advantages in a very short period of time. I think, I think sometimes we get spoiled with uh, how fast technology moves. And it's like, oh, well, that took two years. Well, <laughs> <laughs> two, two years yeah. is, is nothing. Well, you know, it, it, it really is amazing. I mean, we were working on some projects, uh, I'm going to say a decade ago, where, you know, we were doing vision inspection. Mm-hmm. And it took a while to, to, to program the stuff because you had a robot that had to interface with camera, that had to interface with, you know, what's the known standard, what are the tolerances of the being out, all this kind of thing. Where now that's all looped into one. Um, people are, have, have inspection systems that come that way. And, you know, and, and we've done it, had to develop it by communicating through these different, um, uh, well, different platforms really. And, and so it was a real challenge. Um, whereas now that's relatively simple to do. Um, it, and that, you know, helps it. And the, the whole, I mean, if I go back to my Six Sigma background and that part, you know, just the very basics, the first thing they teach you, you know, Y equals F of X. It's, you know, the output is a function of the input. And if you can control the inputs, your output's going to be good. Mm-hmm. And that's really, really what's happened is if people have been able to get control and accuracy of the input. And, you know, again, like when I started machine tools, we were buying high end machine tools because we were trying to make sure that we were making molds to at least within half a thousand. And, you know, 
that was pretty good. So you needed an accurate machine tool. You couldn't buy a cheap one. Right. Well, once we got into the CNC stuff, tool making uh, machinery doesn't usually run, you know, lots of spindle hours. Not like a production shop. Right. But when you get onto the the CNCs, if you don't have accuracy, no one will buy it. So you don't have to buy a really expensive one anymore to get accuracy because the glass scales and everything, you know if it's accurate or not. Right. It's just, you know, uh, I mean, you need a certain amount of power in the controller when you're cutting curves and all that kind of thing. But, you know, basically it's, uh, it's, it's just a tremendous advantage in terms of, of the, the type of, um, tooling that you can, you can, you can buy, it reduces your capital cost. So that, that allows for much better, um, economic viability for different products. Yeah. And that's something that is kind of a go, no go kind of test for things is, is it, viable from a financial standpoint it, it's wonderful that i can do things just like i think that people get confused and they think oh well this is going to replace fabrication or this is going to replace stamping or, or that and the reality is that's not why you go that direction what you want to do is instead of having one part it's an assembly. I'm replacing seven different parts I used to have to put together. And that's where the benefit right. comes from. Or it's, it's really? using a material and a shape I can't do in another way. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the 787 Dreamliner is just the, mm-hmm. the absolute, you know, uh, the show piece for that, where by using the, the composite, they can, they can, uh, get shapes that were just too hard to do with the aluminum mm. and they don't have to, to, to put as many holes in. And as, as one of the aircraft makers told me, <laughs> made a presentation one day and he, his comment was, well, the aircraft business is a, a matter of drilling holes and filling them. <laughs> <laughs> so when you think about that, with all of the rivets and stuff they had, right? So the, the alignment, but they can get a more efficient wing shape relatively easily they can you know uh they don't have as many parts to put together they can they can form them and cure them together uh you know and again they don't have the same fatigue issues using the composite so there's a lot of um, a, a lot of benefits to some of the new uh technologies and the new materials i think that that goes a long way to illustrate to people that Sometimes it's just thinking outside of the box. You know, sometimes we get, we want to, tra- we want to transfer from one technology to another one, but it's the other value added processes that you receive that really help to illustrate why you would change to a, a different type of a, a system like an additive. I, I, I remember when we first started with STEM curriculums and I was not a big proponent for steam until I got involved more in additive. And I realized how much of an impact being creative and having that other side of your brain kind of working because now instead of just thinking of, well, I want to take this same part that I've already been making and make it an additive. No, now you, you, you have the ability to be creative and say, what shapes can I create? What, what materials can I use? And that art side of it really unlocked a lot of potential for people that were very creative, but felt limited by engineering. Not that engineering doesn't, factor into additive because of course it does but there are things that we can do now in additive that if you went by the rule books of engineering you probably would have said no you can't do that do you see more creative people getting into it yeah i i I really do because you have to have a different mindset i mean i i did that with molding versus machining um Mm -hmm. and 
I was working on some aerospace parts in, in uh, metal, and it was really challenging because we were looking at some, you know, accessory non-structural parts within turbine engines. Mm -hmm. And when you started looking at different levers and shafts and things, you go, well, you know, part of it, they were looking at cost. So they had to offset the difference between the cost of the machining and, and fabricating the part versus the weight of the part and what, how that impacted the performance. And of course, you know, weight being everything on, on an aircraft. Mm -hmm. And when we got into it, we started looking at the car. So, well, can you make that part? And I said, yeah, but what shape does it really need to be? Like this, you have some triangulation in this, but do you need it? Do you need the box? Can it just be a shaft? Can it be, you know, what do we need in here? Is that if you just, if you just machined it to reduce the weight, or what's the real structure? And you really need to look at it from a different perspective of where does the strength need to be? Because that's the only place you need to put it when you're doing additive. Whereas when it's subtracted, you're going, well, yeah, we can just leave it a little heavier, particularly for non-weight um, uh, critical components is, well, it just costs more to machine that. Right. So, yeah, we'll leave a little more on there. And then on some things where, you know, shape was defined, it was like, well, yeah, you know, this, this takes a five axis machine. So you've got more degrees of freedom. So you have a little less accuracy. So, you know, you're going through that. It takes a lot of time on the most expensive machine. Can we do a near net shape and just finish it? Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, some of those experiments worked out really well. And I think that's, so, you know, we could, yeah, you, you take something from, uh, you know, an hour's machining to, to, to five minutes. Mm -hmm. And you, you didn't have all the waste material either. That's where I think somebody like yourself that has the ability to come in and, and, and take it down to the root of what is it you need, not just, well, here's the parts we're making, here's a whole list, and here's some drawings and all that. It's more understanding how the part is used and what it's, used for that can really unlock a lot of doors both from quality but more importantly what is the end result you can get a lot better part that acts in the way that we want it to but we have to understand the total usage at the end of it all how do we want it to be used not just well it needs to be a gear it needs to turn this well, what, what is it we're doing? We're turning this and we need this to move this. Okay. If that's what we need, then we need to move from here to here, but we may not need to use all the same parts and we can reduce the parts. We can reduce what it's actually doing, uh, through a, a different mechanism, even through, uh, through additive. Yeah, and that's that's a, a good point. You know, you, you, when you look at changing the design of, of taking away the things that, you know, you may not need. But, but the other thing is in some cases I've seen where we're able to um, design in a mistake-proofing item for an assembly. Uh, you know, so that because you, you know, you could, you could add a little piece somewhere it wasn't a problem, but it might make your overall ingot bigger, or, you know, your, your piece that you were going to machine would be awkward to do it on. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that could be an advantage. I know one of the big advantages for, for molding is, is the, uh, the ability to do conformal cooling. And it's interesting because the, uh, a mold, if you actually think about it, is just a heat exchange device. Yeah. You're, you know, you're taking a material of, of, one form and you're forming it into a shape that you want. And so you, you, you heat it to get it in and then you cool it to, to get it to retain that shape and, and take the part out. Well, as the guys were saying, you know, it's <clears throat> for, for generations, it was, well, how do I get the material into the mold? And then how do I get it out of the mold? And then, Oh yeah, we want to cool it in there too. Well, by the time we get around all of the mechanical to get the material in and the part out, then we'll figure out where to put some cooling in. 
Whereas, you know, with, with additives, you could actually set up to have your, your cooling quite conformal to your surface area, which in a lot of cases with machining, you really can't. Mm-hmm. So in, in some cases, I've heard of like 50% reductions in cycle times because of that. And you don't have as much stress in the part, so it's not likely to work later. Right. Yeah, and so, I can yeah, certainly see that. Yeah, the benefits are just uh, tremendous. So it's really a matter of, of getting the practice and the people out there that are used to it and they're thinking about it differently. And that's where I see some, some brilliant young minds coming along where they're not, you know, I mean, I even had w- one guy that, uh, designer that, that left the industry because he said, well, I can't design anything on a computer. I can't see the whole thing. And to, to do detail now, I've got to zoom in and then zoom back out. And if I'm working on a drafting board, I can see the whole thing as I go. And it's like, okay, you know, so his mind just didn't work to, to zoom in and zoom out again. Right. And, and I see so many of the younger people now and, you know, even, even guys my age, if their, their mindset's right, that, that was never an issue for them. They could just whip through it. Yeah. It, you know, they, they saw the advantages of the computer and they learned how to look at it differently. Well, and, and I think, you know, because 3D has become such a standard in, in most of manufacturing now, it, it really has changed the way we look at things and envision the end uh, the end unit is by you can yeah. actually get a better feel than you used to when you had well I got this assembly so it's this part this part this part and they were all in 2D and you had to try and envision uh, it took a lot of work to try and make that come together in your mind uh, yeah it's, it's- and so, some people can see that the positive and negative spaces and others just it's not not there, right? Right. And that's that's a, a challenge a lot of times for the for guys um, doing tooling is they have to look at negative space a lot of times. Yeah. That's, uh, I think that's a that, great point. I, I get. Yeah, I think some people are wired for it and some aren't. That's yeah. All I can tell you. Yeah. Um, you know, starting from the ground up versus starting with an end piece. It's it's kind of like in the old days of people talking about uh, uh, tremendous uh, people that could work with marble and, you know, and this person's working and they're chipping away at it. And in their minds, they know what it's going to look like at the end of it. Then they're just getting rid of the things that are in the way. And, but most people can't see it. Yeah. I can't see that. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when you when you hear the artist talking about, well, no, it's in there. It's just waiting to be revealed, and a calling. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> but what I see that with the Jamesock Carver guys too. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's yes, true. yes, that's absolutely right? true. Yeah, um, I didn't think of that, but you're absolutely right. You know, those types of people that have that uh, understanding of what it looks like at the end, they can just kind of see it. it, it and they're just removing things to reveal that I'm, I'm more of the additive guy. I could start from the ground up and know what it's going to look like and I can build it to that, but to remove it and get to there, that takes a different, uh, it's, it's a different wiring of your brain. You have to kind of program it a little different to, to make that happen. Yeah. All I remember growing up, I had one of the family friends with a, a printer. Yeah, and his his big he'd worked at the newspaper, but he'd, he'd also worked in a couple of publishing houses, and he was going. Yeah, he talked about color separation. I right. still don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, you know, I've got a I've got a printer here that puts it together, you know, at at my whim. So it's a great tool, but I have no idea how it does. It. <laughs> right? Yeah. No, I, I get that. You know, and I've I've seen some artworks where people are you know, they're printing in different colors and then all of a sudden it's done at the end and it's gosh, but to envision that at the front end, I just, I don't know how people do it. It's, it's beyond me. Hey, Brian, we are just about yeah. out of time here. Uh, how could people okay. reach you? Uh, you can reach me at Brian at kbhd.ca. Or you can catch me at uh, area code 604-644-5162. Great. 
Thank you so much, sir, yeah. for, for being I'm out here. there on LinkedIn as well. On LinkedIn? And what is it? it it's uh, just Brian Holmes? Uh, I think it's Brian Holmes. Uh, and it'd be under KBH as well, or KBH Consulting. Okay, great, great. Uh, and and, right. and you spell it, it's spelled not H-O-M-E-S, H-O-L. No, H-O-L-M-E-S. That's right. Okay. Uh, appreciate your time right. today, sir. Thank you very much. Everybody. Well, thanks, Dean. It's a real pleasure talking to you. Always great, sir. Always, always my pleasure. Thank you for being here. Uh, everybody make it a great day.